So our first talk of the morning and of the day is going to be John Ackerman, N-A-U-R. The title of his talk is GPS Beyond the Basics. Take it away, John. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be the opening act here at Tapperfest 2019. Uh, I'm sure there are much better bands to follow, but uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'd like to talk today about GPS as a step beyond what most of us are using in the ubiquitous cell phones and uh, navigation systems in our cars, et cetera, because it's really quite amazing what the system is capable of. And I got interested in this out of the idea of possibly uh, building a much better uh, GPS disciplined oscillator. And we'll loop around back to that at the very end, but uh, we think that there are ways to uh, make a, a GPS DO that will be cheaper and yet maybe an order of magnitude better uh, it's short term than uh, what we typically see. And if you know me, you know that's the kind of thing that I get excited about. So, so setting the baseline, I think everybody knows about GPS nowadays, at least sort of what it does, but uh, it's a system that's based on trilateration, which is me measuring the uh, distance uh, of a point on Earth uh, from s uh, several satellites that are orbiting uh, around the Earth and uh, we measure the distance by using the time of arrival uh, of uh, the coded signal that the satellite uh, broadcasts. The satellites have very high accuracy clocks on board, and they're monitored from an Earth station, so we know within a matter of uh, probably femtoseconds when the signal is leaving the satellite. So if you know that and you know when it arrives, you can then work out where you are. Uh, traditionally, uh, the the con commercial consumer GPS that most of us are using uses what's called a, a CA, which stands, depending on who you talk to, for course acquisition or uh, 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 course, uh, I forget what this, the second version of A is, but it's a, a, a code that's modulated onto the carrier at 1,575 megahertz. And uh, by determining the time of arrival of that code, you can determine the distance and work back. When GPS first came out, the accuracy was quoted as 100 meters, and that in large part was due to the fact that the government uh, deliberately uh, interfered with the signal to reduce its accuracy so the bad guys uh, wouldn't be able to use it uh, while our military would, would. They discovered before too long that that wasn't practical, so back uh, around uh, 2000 they turned off uh, the, the selective availability signal and the accuracy improved. So today, uh, typically a consumer GPS can get uh, an accuracy of location of around 10 meters in real time. And that ain't, that's not bad at all. It's much better than the original quote. But it turns out we can do orders of magnitude better than that. If we look at a consumer GPS, um, the, the errors come from a number of different uh, areas. Uh, uh, the largest ones are the uncertainty of the orbital information that uh, the satellites have. The, the way the thing works is the satellite has a prediction of where it's going to be at a given time, and that prediction then tells you where, you, where it is to, to do, work out the math. It turns out those predictions are good, but they're not perfect. So there's an error in that predicted location that, that may be off by a few meters. So that's a big error. Another big error is uh, the fact that the atmosphere uh, causes variable timing and, and uh, distortion of the signals, and that reduces the accuracy. So this chart, which uh, I found, this is one of several, uh, and all of them have different numbers in them, by the way, uh, that indicates that you end up with a range of about 6 to 35 meters uh, of accuracy when you figure all of that uh, uh, the different error sources into account. And again, we typically are doing toward the low, low end of that range, maybe 10 meters today. So I decided to test that and see how th uh, what the performance was really like. And my uh, idea was to start out with an ancient, cheap, old, horrible GPS, as the uh, Garmin GPS 20 that Tapper sold, I think it was about 25 years ago. Uh, as a breakthrough low-cost receiver module at that time. Then I also wanted to look at a modern receiver, so I looked at a U-Blox M8, 
Uh, and then I looked at a uh, commercial surveying receiver uh, to see how it would do. And this is all just looking at, at the sentences uh, that come out on the serial port of uh, almost all GPS. It's called NMEA. Uh, it's a standard code, and the GGA sentence provides the lat lon and, and elevation. So I just took that data, converted it into meters east, west, and up, down, and plotted. And this is a, a plot that shows first just the uh, Garmin GPS 20. And what you'll see is that there's a cluster of signals. The, the left side is the X, Y. The right side is the X, which is uh, longitude and elevation. And one thing you can see is that the elevation information is noisier than uh, the uh, lat long. And that is the case in every GPS measurement. The, the fact that we don't have satellites underneath us makes the uh, geometry not work as well for elevation as it does for horizontal. So in every, in every case, you'll see more noise. But what you see, though, is there's generally a, a clump uh, around 10 meters or so uh, high and wide on the XY, but there's a few outliers, uh, if I can, right around here, that require the scale here to go from, I think it's minus 90 meters uh, to plus 10. Uh, so there's a very wide range, but much of that is caused by just those few outliers in the signal. So if we were to look at just the, you know, the, the average, we'd be within that, that 10 meter or so range. Now this added in in blue, I don't know how well you can see it, uh, the uh, Ublox M8 receiver. And you'll see it's, it's more tightly clustered than, uh, excuse me, my phone just decided to go off. Uh, it's more tightly clustered, although it, it still is noisier in the vertical uh, domain. Uh, but you can see 20 years of, of development has caused an improvement, and it does not have those uh, far out uh, outliers. Now, the red is the output from a, a Trimble Net RS, which is a surveying receiver that, when they were new that 10 or 12 years ago, was about $15,000. Uh, plus a couple of thousand dollars for the antenna. Uh, they are no longer so expensive on eBay, uh, which is why I have one. Uh, uh, and you can see it, it's better still, but even a $15,000 surveying receiver has a fair bit of noise when all we do is look at it in standalone mode with no additional help. To, to make things a little bit more clear, this is a zoom in uh, with a, a range of uh, plus and minus 10 meters in, in both scales. And the Garmin is the, is the green, which is again mainly within this 10 meter area, but there's outliers. The blue is the U-Blox, and the red is the uh, uh, NetRS. So again, you can see that you do gain with the more expensive and newer receivers, but you don't gain all that much. But this is all in simple, standalone reading the, the, the NMEA sentence and not doing anything further. Well, it turns out there's a whole lot more than we can, that we can do than that. Uh, the GPS signal that's transmitted actually contains two different codes, the, the CA, uh, which runs at 1.023 megahertz, and a P code, which runs at 10.23 megahertz, and the faster code rate allows you to get better timing information because the bits are closer together and you can uh, correlate on them and, uh, with better uh, accuracy. Um, and also, there are two frequencies. Uh, the one that all of our commercial or civilian GPSs use is at 1575 megahertz, and we call that L1. But there's another frequency that's broadcast uh, at 1247 megahertz, which is called L2. And by using the L1 and the L2 signals together, we can read what the ionospheric distortion is and compensate for it. So there's a huge win in having a dual frequency receiver uh, instead of a single frequency. And if you can use the P code, uh, you get better re resolution. You also have just the carrier. If you can get, uh, actually count the carriers, uh, or, I'm sorry, the cycles of the carrier at 1500 megahertz, you can get even better uh, resolution. So there are s signals available from the satellites that will allow us to get a lot more information and end up with much better results. So this is just a visualization that we have more than just the L1 signal. Uh, we have uh, 
the GPS are the blue, L1 and L2, but there's also GLONASS, um, the uh, European Galileo system, and the Chinese Baidu system, all having multiple signals within those two ranges. Not shown here, there's a, there's a new signal on the latest uh, GPS's, uh, GPS satellites called L5 uh, that's going to be more and more used uh, in the future, but today uh, is not uh, widely used. As I mentioned, there's also more, more signals and more, and more codes. So this is just showing the, the signals that are available on the uh, different uh, carriers. And again, we have this, the CA, which is the narrowest. It has the most energy, so it's the easiest to detect. Um, it's it's uh, energy that's spread into a, a narrower bandwidth, so there's more uh, density. Uh, then we have the P code, and there's also an M code, which is the proprietary military code. Now, even the P code is supposed to be unusable unless you have a, a key from the Department of Defense that allows you to decrypt it. But starting in about 2000, a number of companies came up with ways to uh, extract the code information without having the decryption key. So the, the surveying receivers, and one of the reasons they're so expensive, was that they have that capability of using that P code to get 10 times better resolution from uh, uh, the carrier, uh, the code sequence than you could with the uh, CA code. So putting all that together, you know, how good can we get? Well, if we just look at the resolution that you can get from correlating uh, the code or the carrier, uh, and you, you assume that you can get, I think it's, it's presumed to be about to within one one hundredth of a data element uh, resolution with uh, decorrelation. Uh, just using the CA code, you can get to about three meters. Just using the P code uh, with the civilian decoding schemes, you can get to about 30 centimeters. If you use the actual carrier phase, you can get down to two to two and a half millimeters. So there is a lot of resolution available if you know how to use it. But there's also lots of error sources. You have multipath and these delays from the ionosphere. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, not only is the orbital data not quite correct because it's a prediction rather than an actual observation, uh, but there's also offsets in the, in the clocks and the uh, satellites that, that you can estimate but ahead of time you don't know, and they all introduce additional errors. So the way we do a better job is taking advantage of this additional information that the satellites are broadcasting, and I don't know what the official term is, but I call them precision-capable receivers. And traditionally, uh, these, the survey or, or geodetic receivers were the only ones that gave you that capability. And the common names that you might have heard of uh, are the Ashtec Z12, which is sort of the first one of these units that uh, uh, could really get down to millimeter level. Uh, but that, it was available starting right before 2000. Um, then Trimble made the, the Net RS, uh, which is available surplus, and there are several newer generations of that. But again, as I mentioned, they're like $15,000 a piece to start with, uh, so not exactly in a ham budget. But because the Z12 and the, and the Net RS are obsolete, you can find them on eBay for a few hundred dollars. If you're really lucky, I got a, a Z12 for 150 uh, that included a Pelican carrying case and an antenna and all sorts of other cool stuff. Uh, so the bargains are, are there. Unfortunately, after three weeks, that receiver died. So, you know, you, you get what you paid for. Uh, but, but, but those are the receivers that have traditionally been used for, for precision surveying. But uh, a company called Ublox has really taken over the OEM world, uh, uh, GPS world by storm. And they've had a series of, of very capable receivers that are very inexpensive. Uh, going down to, you know, if you buy a thousand of the, of the little modules, they're in the $10, $20 price range. Their two most recent generations are the M8, uh, and those are available, if you just buy the module, you might find it for about $60. If you go to um, SparkFun or one of the other companies that, that uh, provide a board with the module mounted on it and other life support 
systems, yeah, 200 to $250 for the one that's the, the most capable version. It still is a single frequency receiver, but it has the ability to do corrections, something called RTK, which I'll get to in a, in a moment. And it has the carrier phase output that allows you to extract the most uh, accurate data. It covers uh, GPS, GLONASS, and Baidu, but not Galileo. And that's been available for a few years, and people have done some really good work with it. But it's kind of 10 to 100 centimeter, uh, I'm sorry, 10, 10 to uh, centimeter to a meter kind of accuracy range, typically. The most recent generation is the ZF9 that's just been out for a few months. And it is a dual frequency receiver. Uh, so it does L1 and L2. It's got this real-time processing engine and carrier phase. It also does Galileo in, in addition to the other satellites. I think the receiver is something like 277 channels uh, capable. And it's quoted as centimeter accuracy. Uh, and from what I've been able to find in the data sheets, what they mean by that is a uh, sort of 1 to 10 centimeter uh, resolution when you're using it in, in corrected mode. I have one of these coming. I think it actually arrived yesterday, about 10 minutes after I left home. Uh, but uh, I'll be playing with that, and I'm going to add uh, to uh, this presentation uh, with those results when I have them. So how do these corrections work? Well, if you are an old, old-timer, gray-beard, tapper person, you might remember that we had a, a differential GPS kit. Uh, Doug McKinney at KC3RL, who sadly passed away, uh, designed that. And the idea was that you would take a GPS and survey its location very accurately, and then uh, it would transmit correction data, and we, we did this via packet radio, uh, to, to transmit the correction information that the remote receiver could use. And since the, t the two systems, the, the base station and the rover, were both seeing the same satellites, if you compensate for the noise in one, if I know exactly where I am, because I've, I've surveyed it, and I know what, what the GPS is telling me where I am, I can subtract that difference and provide a correction. And that's, that's what these systems did. And that original design got you down to within about one, one meter of accuracy, but it required having that known base station and a, pl and a way to communicate the data. So that's kind of the genesis of all of this uh, uh, correction technology. And today we do the same thing, but in, in a much more accurate way. The modern equivalent is called real-time kinematics, or RTK. It's the same idea as the, as the uh, differential GPS, but the real-time stands for the fact that you get this correction data with almost no latency, typically just a few seconds. And kinematics, because it's largely designed for mobile surveying use. So let's say you're a uh, highway engineer and you're plotting out the location for a new road. You'd set up your base station in one spot, and then your rover can literally be in a moving vehicle, and you can drive to and, and get a plot with great accuracy of, of exactly where you were without having to be in a fixed spot. So RTK is uh, uh, very widely used. Typically, it uses the dual frequency receivers, and you can get millimeter level accuracy from it. It's just amazing, uh, and it really depends only on uh, how well you surveyed the location of the base station, and also how far you are from the base to the rover. Uh, typically, the quotes that I've seen are that you get useful results anywhere up to f from 50 to 100 kilo kilometers away from uh, or distance between the base and the rover. Uh, and that's not a hard cutoff, it's just the performance gets worse and worse the further away th that you are. You can provide those corrections by radio, by, by cell phone, or by the internet. And the base station can either be something that you set up yourself. If you're a surveying company, you'll set up a, a GPS at the known uh, marker location, and it'll transmit its data, you know, often uh, by a, a digital radio system or, or even cell phone uh, GSM type connection. Uh, and then that's the most accurate way because you're looking, again, over a short distance and and getting very precise corrections. Uh, there are also thousands and thousands of what are called continuously operating reference stations in the US. 
and they are uh, typically run by like state Depar uh, tr uh, transportation department agencies. So in Ohio, there's one of these stations pretty much in every county in the state. Uh, some of them make their available their data available in real time. More of them, it's after the fact. So you take your recording in the field, bring it back to the office. A few hours later, you download the correction data from the uh, reference station, and then you process it all together. But these stations are, are literally everywhere. Uh, you're typically you're go going to be within 10 or 20 miles of one, uh, so that's a, a very useful tool. The other method uh, that's commonly used is called precise point positioning. And in this system, instead of getting a correction from another uh, accurately surveyed station and just m measuring the differences, uh, there are, are reference stations around all over the world that are looking at the satellites and monitoring their precise orbital location rather than the predicted location. And they're also um, monitoring the, the clock offset. And, up, and with that data that they get in real time, they're able to correct, say, well, no, I know that the satellite said it was here. It was really here. And you can apply that correction. This isn't as accurate as real-time kinematics because it, it doesn't take into account that the, the local uh, differences, but it can get you easily to within a meter in real time. And the advantage is you don't need to have a base station. Uh, I've, I've been using this method with data coming from stations located in Europe, and it works just fine here in the US. Canada is really big on this because large countries, very sparsely populated, they can't put a reference station you know, every 50 kilometers uh, on a grid, so they use the precise point positioning to allow accurate surveying in the very uh, unpopulated areas. So it, it works really well. So I, I've already mentioned the correction sources. For RTK, we use one of the uh, uh, continuously operating reference stations or our own private uh, base station. Uh, the PPP corrections come from various places, and there's various types of corrections that you can download uh, from, from different sites. And that uh, PPP correction information actually comes in three flavors. Uh, you can get the ultra-rapid results within about an hour uh, for post-processing. Uh, you can get the rapid results in about a day, and the rapid results are quite a bit better than the ultra-rapid. And if you want to wait two weeks or so, you can get the final results. Well, there's actually very little difference between the rapid and the final. But the, the final is collecting information worldwide and post-processing and, and getting the very precise actual orbital information, and you get somewhat better results by doing that. There's another type of correction, and I'm really not going to talk about much today, but because some of you may have heard of it, I wanted to mention. There's a thing called the Wide Area Augmentation System, or WAS, and sometimes it's also called Satellite-Based Augmentation System, or SBAS. And that is a set of uh, monitoring stations in the, in the US and a few in other countries that are collecting that, this actual orbital data uh, and feeding it to a central processing station, which then uploads the data uh, to a geosynchronous satellite, and you can then receive the corrections from that satellite. And it was primarily intended uh, for uh, aircraft navigation, because typical single-frequency GPS isn't accurate enough for the FAA to allow uh, pure GPS-guided uh, landings. Uh, with the corrections from the WAS system, it gets down typically to about a meter a horizontal and a meter and a half vertical, and that is as good as the FAA requires. So it's a system that's available to anyone, but it's primarily designed uh, for use uh, by aircraft, and there are easier ways to get corrections that are that good than using the, the geosync satellites. So uh, it's interesting, but I'm not considering it as one of the methods that we're using in, in the GPSDO project. The most popular software that's used for this stuff is called RTK Lib, uh, written by a, a professor in Japan, and it is incredibly powerful. Uh, it was originally written in Windows, but it's been ported to Linux. Um, 
the user interface I can only describe as actively hostile. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is not easy to figure out, and the documentation doesn't help. Uh, so there, there's a fair bit of magic involved, but once you get it working, it is incredibly capable. It can be used both for real-time processing uh, uh, with RTK and real-time PPP, and you can also download files later and feed into it to do post-processing. So it's, it's extremely versatile. Um, and yeah, it's a tool that you pretty much need to play with if you're going to uh, be working in this space. Uh, some receivers, and these U-Blocks ones that I mentioned earlier, have the RTK engines built in, which means that they can e uh, act as a base station and generate the, out uh, the corrections directly and send it out on the serial port to be transmitted, or you can feed the corrections directly into the receiver, and uh, it can do that calculation inside the GPS module without needing a separate PC to process it. Uh, so that's uh, very useful, something that I haven't played with yet because I haven't had one of these receivers that, that has that capability. But the one that just came will allow that, so I'm hoping to uh, try that next week. Uh, there's also uh, a, a product that uBlox provides with their receivers called uCenter, and it has some capabilities. You can set all the receiver parameters, but it can also do RTK uh, processing, and it's, it's, again, not a particularly easy tool to use, but if you're working with the U-Blox receivers, you pretty much need it. There are a few other software Five tools. Five-minute warning, John. Oh, okay. Then I, then I need to move, because you ran late. Um, <laughs> how, uh, how, okay. Fifteen minutes late, actually. Keep it? Go, John. Keep going. <laughs> so there are a few, there are a few other tools. Um, most of these survey receivers like to output in a proprietary format, of course, because then you can spend several thousand dollars on their software. There are tools that will let you translate. Uh, one important one is called TEQC, which is free but not open source, and it does all sorts of data conversions. And because I don't like having to go through multiple steps, I'm just finishing up a Python program that will take the data stream from the Ashtech receivers and dump it directly into uh, what's called Rhinex, which is an industry standard uh, portable format. So you can have the receiver hooked to a PC, log the data, and you have a, an output file that you can uh, directly use. I've, I've already kind of touched on a lot of this, but this is just the relative accuracy of the different methods of real-time solutions uh, with uh, differential RTK and PPP. The SPP is the standard precision, precision otherwise just the GPS outputting uh, NMEA data without any help. So you can see that you get from 2.3 meters down to about a centimeter uh, with RTK. So quite, quite impressive results. And that's real time. That's not waiting later. So uh, these are some results using RTK. And this is uh, also a bit of a Rorschach uh, test. Uh, but what, what we see here is real-time results from the big green blob is the NetRS receiver just in standalone mode. Uh, same, same data, basically, that we saw earlier. Uh, the blue trace that you can probably see is the um, precise point positioning results, which it wanders around a bit within a meter or so but it's, it's certainly better than the standalone. And there's a red dot there that you probably cannot see uh, that is the uh, RTK result. Uh, and for the RTK, I just had two receivers on the same antenna, and I set one up as the base and the other as the correction. Uh, so it's, it, uh, was be, the, the, quote, rover was stationary on the same antenna, but it was being corrected by the base station. So this is even more of a Rorschach test. This is showing uh, at a much higher scale. This is plus and minus um, one meter, uh, X and Y. Uh, and again, the big green, that is uh, just the, the noise of the uh, single point solution. Now, the blue, that's the, the precise point positioning. And you see it wanders around a bit, but it still is much, much tighter than the uh, standalone. And then finally, you might just possibly be able to see a little red dot in the center, 
we'll, we'll zoom in. So this is now a scale of one, uh, 10 centimeters plus and minus in each direction. So the blue is the precise point. The red, which you can now see, is the R, uh, RTK result. And you can see that even there, uh, there's more noise on the vertical than on the horizontal, although they're both still way, way better. Yes? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This, so this is plus and minus uh, five meters. Uh, actually, uh, this was auto scale. This is plus and minus five vertical, plus and minus six horizontal, plus and minus five vertical, plus and minus six horizontal on that. More or less, yeah. Thank yeah. you. This is minus two, minus three, minus four. John? Yes. What is the time scale? Oh, this is, I'm sorry. This is 12 hours of data. Okay. So that was all real-time processing. Another interesting thing we can do is post-processing uh, by collecting data and then feeding correction data uh, this you know, ultra-rapid or rapid or final data back into it. There are two services uh, that are widely used for this. One of them is run by NOAA in the U.S., and it's called OPUS. Uh, the other one is run by the Nat Natural Resources Canada, and uh, it's the NRCAN precise posi uh, point positioning site. Um, they, they each use a different method. OPUS uses these continuously operating reference stations that I mentioned earlier. The NRCAN uses PPP with just the orbital data and, and no uh, reference uh, station input. So they give different kinds of results. And here's what you can get uh, from OPUS. It's, and it's very interesting. You have to look at the fine print. This, this is the result we get. So we're at five decimal places of seconds. And this is the peak-to-peak -peak error. So in lat, six meters, uh, I'm sorry, six millimeters, seven millimeters in lawn, uh, seven millimeters in elevation. Uh, I'm sorry, seven millimeters east and west. Elevation is th uh, 13 millimeters of GPS elevation, but when you convert that to match the, the geoid model, the Earth not being precisely round or, or elliptical, you see you get about double the error, which just comes from having to do the mathematical conversion. So this is, again, this is peak-to-peak -peak value, and the RMS value in three dimensions from this data set was about, uh, I think it was uh, 25 millimeters, so basically an inch cube uh, where the results were. This is the NRCAN. Its results are, are 95 percent, or two sigma, it, so it's showing uh, 4 millimeters, 7 millimeters, 14 millimeters, but that's 2 sigma rather than peak to peak. So the numbers are, sm are small, small or similar, but this isn't quite as good as this. So, you know, you didn't think that I would give a whole presentation without talking about timing, right? <laughs> so I took the same types of measurements uh, looking at uh, a raw uh, pulse per second GPS like we've been using for hundreds of years. That's the blue plot on this line. And you can see it, it wobbles around a little bit. And the scale here is, um, this is, it's not, not quite linear, it's uh, one in, minus one in 10 to the seventh, zero in the center, plus one in 10 to the seventh, or uh, 100 nanoseconds at the top. So the blue line is, is the traditional GPS. The uh, violet line, which is wiggly but much, much quieter, is the uh, real-time real processing using uh, the uh, uh, precise uh, positioning uh, algorithm in real time. And the red line, there's actually two lines laid over this red and the green, uh, are uh, the post-processed results. You can see how much quieter that is. Now, to zoom in a, a little bit more, the green is the ultra-rapid 
the red is the rapid, and it's a little bit hard to see, uh, but now the scale is, by the way, uh, plus and minus one nanosecond instead of, of 10, uh, instead of 100, rather. But you can see that the, the peaks and valleys of the red line are, are less than of the green line. So there is an improvement by getting the, the rapid uh, data the next day rather than the ultra rapid data a day or so later. Putting that all together, uh, the statistic that we use in timing is called Allen deviation. And you can think of it very much as standard deviation that works for this kind of, of noise. Uh, uh, if you do a standard deviation on, t on clocks, you end up with bad results. So they came up with a slightly different measurement. And what we're looking at here is, if you can think of it as the average amount of noise on successive measurements, if you take the measurements one second apart, 10 seconds apart, 100 seconds apart, 1,000, 10,000. So you're, you're really looking at how noisy it is. If, at, at ten, if you took measurements every second, you would expect there to be about uh, 15 nanoseconds of noise second by second on, on this plot. And what you see is that the, the plots go down at a slope of more or less minus one uh, because you have a fixed amount of noise, but you're averaging it over longer and longer time periods, so it becomes less uh, of a component of the total. So the blue line is the old-fashioned GPS pulse per second. This line is the real-time correction. So you can see we've picked up just about an order of magnitude by applying the real-time corrections. These lines are the um, uh, ultra-rapid and the rapid post-processed. Now, it starts here because the, the post-processing site only works on data every 30 seconds. So, that, so I can send them data every second, but my results back are 30-second steps. So that starts here. But you can see we are basically two orders of magnitude better than the real-time and three orders of magnitude uh, almost better than the standalone GPS, which means that if we use these signals uh, to drive a, a disciplined oscillator, we can have the, the GPS stability kick in much earlier using this, these process sig results than if we use the, uh, the simple uh, single frequency GPS that, that's what, what's been used in just about every GPS DO so far. So uh, the idea is probably by using, so, I'm sorry, back one, probably by using this signal, because this is real time, we can get at least an order of magnitude improvement uh, for the same cost, assuming our receiver is capable of doing that processing. So uh, the, the new GPS that I'm design, uh, GPS DO that I'm designing that will hopefully become part of the Tangerine SDR that you're going to hear about later. Uh, we'll, we're going to try to use this method, and the result is we should be able to use a much cheaper crystal uh, to get the same performance by having a better quality, uh, less noisy GPS signal. So that is, that is it. Uh, here are a few resources. Uh, there's a uh, government, uh, sorry, an, an educational nonprofit called UNAVCO that does uh, geodetic surveying, looking for earthquakes and things like that. And they have a, a website with incredibly useful information uh, that I recommend very highly. There's lots of detailed stuff about the different receivers and the different processing tools. Uh, and they have a, the, a piece of software that I, I don't think I mentioned earlier called TEQC that's a, a kind of a Swiss Army knife for uh, data processing and you can obtain that for free from them. I already mentioned RTKLib. This is the website where you can download it. Um, the official release, which is 2.4.2, is really, really, really old, and it doesn't have a lot of the features that we need to do the things I've been describing. Uh, the most recent versions are 2.4.3 beta 31, and I think there's actually been one or two additional ones since uh, I did this work, and that has the, the capabilities that are needed for, for what I've shown. Uh, the official packages in Debian uh, are old and don't have the capabilities. I took that, uh, the Debian packages, and ported the updates into it and created my own packages uh, 
that, uh, that re reflect the, the B31 code. Those are available from download from my website. Um, I've also been working on uh, the logging software for the Ashtech receivers. I have one bug yet to fix. When that's finished, that'll be available on my website as well. And uh, if you're on the Time Nuts mailing list or are interested in joining it, there are frequent discussions about precision GPS on that as well. And with that, Steve, I'm finished, unless there are any questions. Any quick, quick, quick uh, questions? Wait for the microphone to get to you, please. Okay, going okay. once, going twice. Stunned at the silence. Oh, there we go, we got yeah, a question. Yeah, John. Hold on, hold on. I was wondering, uh, have you worked with uh, the newer Trimble receivers um, as opposed to the, to the U-blocks? Because I've seen people, you know, using them, loving them. They're, they're, they, they work really well. But what about the, um, the uh, newer Trimble? Um, I'm not sure which Trimble series. There, there's the surveying receivers, yeah. which went from the NetRS to the R7, R8, and R9. The problem is those are all still the 15 kilobuck range, so they're, oh. they're not practical to work with. The, the NetRSs are, are remarkably nice receivers. They've got Ethernet interface, and, and you know, it's all web-driven. Mm -hmm. um, they're obsolete, but they still work incredibly well. The, the one downside of both the, the NetRS and the Ashtex mm -hmm. uh, is that they're GPS only. They don't oh. do GLONASS or, or Baidu or, or uh, Galileo. Okay. But, but for timing purposes, it turns out that's not a problem because if you try to get time from two constellations, yeah. you get confused. So for timing, you really want to stick to just one oh, and GPS one. is the one we want to use. Okay. So it's not really a negative for this application. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Hi, Dave Dahl, K5XD. Hi, Dave. Being here in Detroit in the auto industry, I guess it's a big thing now with the cars. They're going to have the self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what kind of stuff they're using? Or are they using the cores, the ground-based stuff at all, or anything like that? That's a really good question. I, I have not learned much about it. I'm, I'm guessing that the autonomous vehicles are going to need something more than, than standard uh, single frequency, right. single code receivers. Exactly. But I don't, I don't know quite what they're using. I'm sure they want it the cheaper the better because they're going to make them by the thousands or yeah. whatever, you know, so very good. Okay. Uh, sorry if this was already touched on. Um, with, the, uh, ac with the system that had the accuracy up to millimeters, uh, was there a time penalty to that, or could we see, um, like, uh, like what he said with the cars, um, like a real-time GPS that gives us that close, in, um, that close accuracy? Yeah, the real-time kinematics, our RTK system is real-time, uh, basically as, as fast as the base station is able to send corrections. So yeah, you can get that millimeter accuracy uh, while you're driving, if, if you are communicating with, with the base station that has a known position. Yeah, you okay. you can you can you can get all three, but again, the the vertical uh, elevation that is almost always going to be it seems like about one and a half times worse than the horizontal, but but so you still could be within you know a few millimeters uh, vertically. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. One last question here. I've always wondered what the vertical measurements were relative to. Ah, do we have another fifteen minutes? <laughs> um, um, tonight at the social you do. The, 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 the quick answer is that the raw GPS calculations are, are based on what's called Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, which is the center of mass of the Earth and how many meters you are up, down, sideways. Uh, the problem is that the Earth is not a perfect sphere and there are various corrections that you apply. And I've, I showed in one of the slides where there were two different elevations shown. One is, was the ellipsoid, which is the calculation that GPS does natively. Uh, the other was called orthometric, which is what surveyors use based on the actual tr you know, transit surveys that, that were done 100 years ago. And there can be as much as 30 meters difference between them. Uh, and then there are additional 
different datum uh, that, that can be applied. And of course, on top of all this is the fact that you know, we, where we stand right now, we're moving uh, counterclockwise about two millimeters a year. So the, the plate tectonics changes all this, and there are uh, rises and, and successions of, a, of the surface. So g getting elevation is, is a really, really complicated thing. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>